Thanks, Dean, and thanks everyone for joining today, no matter which time zone you're in. Uh, I miss meeting you all in person and discussing the science uh, over coffee breaks and uh, doodling on pieces of paper, um, but this is a great turnout. So I would like to give an update on the atmospheric imaging assembly. Uh, I'll give some science highlights, but of course, uh, that is a tall order. And again, apologies in advance for missing out the thousands of papers that ought to be mentioned as well. Um, but I would also like to give the uh, update on the analysis techniques and the instrument status. So with that, let's start. Okay, here you go. So this is a 304 image of the sun taken on the 11th anniversary of SDO. Uh, just nice prominence there. Um, the summary of the instrument status is that AIA is nominal. I would like to remind us that um, we all enjoyed SDO as a community resource uh, because of the efforts of large teams of people. And this is one photo of such a team. Uh, these are people um, primarily from the AIA and HMI teams uh, on our front lawn uh, taken in November, 2005. Um, many of them are, are still working with us. Uh, some have retired, some have passed away. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, we enjoy all the great science data because of people like uh, this group. And then this is another photo shows uh, Carl Shriver. He is uh, still very active in science, actually. Uh, he's the second PI for AIA, and I took over the PI ship from him a few years ago. Uh, last year, we had a celebration of the one decade of SDO at Stanford and invited many people to come back. Uh, so just want you to know that it is a huge team that supports it. And missing from all these photos are, of course, our colleagues from the Smithsonian who contributed greatly to uh, the construction of the telescopes. And Alan's there next to Phil. Uh, he was the first PI. So we see we see our um, continued operation uh, of AIA as um, stewardship of a community resource. And okay, so we've taken more than two hundred and twenty million images of the sun with AIA since launch. The the nominal uh, sequence is a. Uh, the extreme ultraviolet images at 12 second cadence, the UV channels at 24 second cadence. There is a 4,500 angstrom image taken still once an hour, but uh, already for many years because of, uh, we think uh, pinholes in the front entrance filter, uh, the image quality due to some uh, scattered light uh, in the 4,500 is, is not good, uh, not useful for science. Uh, so, so it's not really used for anything. Um, the, uh, these artifacts are not affecting the extreme ultraviolet light and the ultraviolet light channels because um, there are also focal plane filters that block out that scattered light. So um, the last workshop we had was in 2018. We continue to monitor the throughput um, with, uh, in collaboration with the EVE team. Uh, now we're using the FISM2 model. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. That's from Phil Chamberlain. Um, and one can follow the long-term trending um, at this web page. Uh, this presentation will be posted online so you, you can follow the links later. Okay, so uh, to remind you all, uh, the sensitivity of the AIA channels degrades uh, as the mission proceeds. Um, there are things that get deposited on the detectors or the optical elements. And so the throughput uh, decreases. They're decreasing at a lower rate than at the beginning of the mission. Um, during the prime phase, we did some bakeouts um, and found that the 
um, degradation continued rather rapidly after the breakout. Um, and it's been the decision since then that we uh, chose not to do bakehouse to try to recover some sensitivity. Uh, uh, one reason is that um, there's always some risk involved. Another is that um, we have a fairly good handle, on, reasonable handle on the absolute calibration of the different and the intercalibration between the channels um, by using the the Eve sounding rocket data as well as the FISM2 data. Uh, FISM2 is a semi-empirical model uh, which predicts the daily EUV flux and, and that allows us to try to track the degradation so that people can do uh, quantitative analysis with the data and not just uh, morphological studies. Um, so that's been the decision so far. It doesn't preclude that we would do bakeouts in the future. Um, but so far, um, the, even, even though the 304 channel, for example, is about at 10% of the throughput at the beginning of the mission, um, as I showed before, the 304 image still has quite a lot of signal. Uh, for some studies, it might become harder, like for studying spicules, but um, for, most, for most science cases, we, we haven't been approached with a compelling reason that we should do a big out. And now we have a new method to track degradation using machine learning, which I'll talk about later on. Okay, oh, one, one more thing. The level one data does not correct for this degradation. And so you would have to apply that manually. Um, if, you, if you do DEM analysis, for example, uh, that matters. Okay, to the science. This is a word cloud um, from the abstracts of the science papers that are refereed that use AIA data. So the, uh, the, the salient topics, science topics that are addressed with AIA data include, uh, of course, flares and waves and active regions. Um, and there's many more. Uh, there's a whole potpourri of them. I can only highlight a few sort of prominent science scientific papers that have been published since launch. Uh, this one by the Pontier et al on using AIA data together with uh, Hinode and with ICE data track the origins of um, how plasma is heated. So that was a nice study combining data from the three different missions. Um, there are other follow-on data, uh, uh, follow-on papers um, that talk about how the the strength of the the wiggles in the coronal field is uh, has a power that is enough to heat the solar wind. So, so these are important studies for uh, large swath of helio physics. Uh, there was a quite a large group. Um, that organized an easy workshop on studying oscillatory processes in solar and stellar coronae. And I would encourage you to look at the presentations and, and seek out the authors and participants of this workshop. Um, they made a very nice uh, workshop image from the SDO data here. Um, but they also um, has, they have a lot of papers published and some, and also presentations summarizing the work on uh, waves. Uh, people have used the HMI and EIA data uh, together with ICE data to study the, the thermal structure of active regions. Uh, this paper by Warren Weinbarger and Brooks, for example, looked at a survey of active regions with different uh, unsigned fluxes and looked at the structure of the, the corona. Um, and they developed a method to, to pick out uh, the, the, warm, the, the warm components or the, the hotter components of the uh, 94 channel um, so that they can isolate it because um, in the 94 channel, there, there's a cooler component too. Um, and so you can do these studies, um, but what 
still remains to be really studied in detail is um, what is the relationship between the thermal structure and what happens at the photosphere. For example, when it's emerging flux, um, is it hotter? Um, there are starting to be papers about it now from, from the SAO team, for example, uh, but um, there's so much data and so much work to do. Uh, there are studies on element bombs and UV bursts. So, so this shows uh, data from the Swedish Solar Telescope, from IRIS and the Solar Dynamics Observatory um, on uh, little brightenings that are in the low atmosphere. And what is found is that um, these are often co-spatial with uh, element bombs in the H-alpha wings, and they are signatures of uh, magnetic cancellation slash reconnection in the low atmosphere. And this is another study which uh, confirms the point. Let me show that picture for a few more seconds. So there's just such a great opportunity for studies using different observatories. Um, that includes New Star. So uh, people have used uh, New Star to observe the sun together with AIA um, to constrain the higher temperature components of the differential emission measure of active regions. Um, so AIA doesn't provide enough strong constraints at the high temperature end. So it's good to use uh, X-ray telescopes to, to aid that. Uh, people have calibrated their models of the solar corona, the MHD models of the solar corona with AIA data. So um, in this awesome model from the Michigan group, uh, they have somewhat of a, a free parameter in their model for the wave heating, um, such that uh, it, it's linked to the, the magnetic field distribution at the bottom boundary. And, and so you can use the AIA images um, and compare with the synthetic coronal images from the model to calibrate that free parameter. And since then, this model has been used a lot, not just for uh, solar studies of uh, the solar wind and coronal mass ejections, but also for other exoplanet hosts for studying the space weather around other stars. And so it's making a huge impact. I would like to say that SDO is making a huge impact on how we think about the environment of exoplanets. Uh, partly because of uh, studies like these that um, allow one to try to validate the MHD models and then they uh, then apply to other stars. Um, and for those stars, they may assume a magnetic distribution or they use Seyman Doppler imaging for the magnetic maps. And then you can consider whether stellar winds might be too strong. Uh, for there to be an atmosphere on certain planets, uh, for example, on the Trappist system. Uh, so, so SDO is not just about uh, what happens at the sun and in the heliosphere, or even in our own solar system regarding planets. The high cadence observations from AIA allowed for the detection of uh, hot flux rubs before they erupted to become CMEs. And so, so uh, one of the early reports was by Jiang Chen and Ding in Nature Communications. Uh, and since then, there has been a lot of work on looking at the formation of flux rubs. There is another EC team that wrote a Space Science Review article on this. Uh, worth noting is that um, this involved, I guess, most of the Greek solar physics community in this paper. And the uh, relatively high resolution and high cadence observations allowed the I, apparent identification of uh, instabilities um, in the corona. So, so we're used to thinking about the Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities in, in uh, hydro fluids, um, but here it also appears that when the uh, corona mass ejects, the flux rub is erupting, that um, the velocity shear might have uh, instigated the 
the developments of these uh, wavy patterns that are that are common in the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. And then in in the current sheets um, where the eruptions are, are forming, uh, there was the detection of plasma blobs, which reminded uh, our Japanese colleagues of uh, uh, the conjectured plasmoids uh, by uh, Shibata Sensei et al. And so this 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 was a this was a big deal because uh, there is some evidence for this type of a patchy and an episodic reconnection in the corona. And, and by the way, if I am correct, uh, this paper by Takasao was uh, done when, uh, maybe it was his first paper uh, or first conference presentation when he was a master student. So, so um, SDO data has been used to train a lot of students um, who now uh, are themselves uh, faculty members training the next generation, which is great. And in terms of uh, studying the details of uh, flares, um, this was a famous uh, M plus flare at the limb uh, with lots of papers. This is not a, an exhaustive list. Uh, looking at how um, there are outflows and sunward uh, outflows from the current sheets and the timing with respect to the X rays. Um, so lots of lots of good physics gleaned from from these studies. Um, from the 2017 flare, there was a recent study from uh, CJU et al. Um, they looked at uh, AIA-131 running difference movies to identify the, the oppositely directed outflows from the current sheet. And they looked at the timing with regards to microwave bursts. And so that that's uh, very nice. This is what you can do. You, you can really start to test uh, the physical theories of uh, reconnection and of flares, and with so with a combination of so many different observations. And uh, STO by itself is already very capable, but um, together with other observatories, we're in much better shape. So. I would like to talk a little bit about the analysis tools. Uh, many of us here are already familiar with how to load AIA data. Uh, at the beginning of the mission, even before launch, actually, uh, we were developing the heliophysics events knowledge base. Um, because we knew that there will be a data deluge and people cannot download all the data and look through them to find events of interest. And we needed a marketplace for people to share what they found. It's not really a marketplace, it's more like a, a collaborative workspace. Uh, and so you can get your data easily. And um, the hack continues to be uh, developed. Also with um, some IRIS support and I would like to reiterate and re-advertise that um, uh, the good thing about HEC is that um, you don't have to build your own catalog. You can upload your own events. You can find other people's events. You can revise them. Uh, you can predict your foot points for Parker Solar Probe and upload them. And if you have written a paper about some events, you can add a link to your paper. So it allows much more connections to be made so that you can share and uh, accelerate discovery. So there's a recent talk at COSPA from Neil uh, about this. I encourage you to take a look. And of course there are APIs for these. Okay, so um, there's still a lot of papers. The majority of papers are using AIA data uh, for image analysis, um, but there really is a a lot to be gained from doing uh, differential emission measure inversions. And so many papers have shown that um, depending on the exact science you want, um, you can get sufficiently reliable DEM inversions uh, to, to study the, the system. There are many codes out there. Um, the AIA team has its own, um, and there's a tutorial for that from this link. 
uh, is relatively fast, but I would like to, and it's been used quite a lot, but I would like to show what, why, why we want people to do DM maps. For example, when you look at an active region emerging, you can look at the emission measure at different temperature bins, and you can see that, um, oh, the hot stuff might be where there's a magnetic uh, field being clashed together, where there's emerging flux. You can see the, the active region looks a little bit like an onion with different layers. Some layers are hotter. The core regions are, tend to be hotter. So that's much more informative than to do a DEM through a single pixel or a patch and then just look at a curve because when you just look at the curve, it's just the superposition of a bunch of loops, which doesn't actually uh, tell you that much without the spatial context. Um, you can follow active regions from, from when they are beginning to be born. Uh, this is a paper about um, some radio bursts that um, were observed um, by Parker Probe. Um, they used AIA data, but not the DEM analysis. And, and they, they argue that um, the, the activity that they measure at PSP was due to this active region. Um, and you can do that with the, just the EUV data alone, but you can do even more if you study the thermal structure. Here, for example, you can see that in the, in the highest temperature being shown, there's almost no emission measure. Uh, this is a relatively simple active region, whereas in the previous one, it was more complex. So I uh, encourage people to do more of this type of studies. Okay, uh, there is a new code uh, published last year from Plowman and Caspi which is called simple regularized DEM. And um, it's quite fast, um, if not faster than the, the AI team's DEM code. And the nice thing is that it is very concise. In fact, they showed off by having just half a page of the code uh, in the paper, and they are working on a Python version. So looking forward to that. Um, they, they compared, uh, the left is their result. This is the emission measure at one mega Kelvin. Um, the right is from the AI team's DEM code. Um, and this is at a different temperature. And it seems like that uh, when at the low signal to noise regions above the limb, it's a little bit less uh, uh, biased. Um, the, the sparse DEM code from the AI team uh, likes to prefer low emission measure solutions, okay? Very importantly, I want to advertise that um, the AIA team has worked a lot um, with an effort led by Will Barnes on developing the AIA Pi package, which is a SunPi affiliate package so that people can do a lot of data analysis with Python. And we think that's definitely um, going to be the future. And we invite you all to help contribute. It's very easy to install. Just do pip install AIA Pi. There is an example gallery. Uh, one thing that we realized with the SolarSoft package was that um, we were not very explicit on what AIA prep does. So we wanted to break out the steps with this sequence of uh, gallery examples. For example, how, how um, to align and, uh, the, the AIA data and how to update the keywords. Um, if you want to compensate for the degradation, how you do it, how you might respike. I mean, uh, a lot of it is mentioned in the, uh, the SDO analysis guide, but uh, people end up forgetting about the different steps involved. So we wanted to break it out and also how to, how to deconvolve uh, images and how to compute wavelength response functions. Um, there's no DEM example yet. Uh, other people are working on their own DEM codes. I, we hope to add DM examples soon. So Ian Hanna has a Python version of his regularized DM code. Okay, I don't have that much time left. I would like to talk about how um, we've prepared a machine learning data sets for use. And there are lots of papers applying machine learning to SDO using this data set or not. Um, I'm sure hopefully in future talks, some of it will be covered. We train a neural network to produce proxy EVE level two data from AIA so that it can be extended past 2014.
I want to. Uh, you can rearrange the neural network after training so that you can have these proxy sort of like a spatially arranged uh, level two irradiance predictions of the maps of the, the sun in the different lines. Uh, we have a method to calibrate AIA uh, using the degraded images. So I suppose you don't know how much is degraded. Could you guess the degradation factor? So this paper was just accepted and will be published in ANA. Um, the idea is that you have a true curve in this hypercube of degradation factors, but you don't know what it is. You don't, and you want to disentangle from solar evolution. But we've only observed one solar cycle and we only use a few years for training. How do we do that? Um, so we basically oversample. We randomly pick these degradation factors, train the neural network to recognize what they are. And so in the end, we can produce these degradation curves, which actually match um, to within the uncertainties what the sounding rocket uh, gives us. So we will continue to apply this in the future to monitor um, as, a, as an additional method. OK, point spread function. The, the, because of the diffraction pattern from the, the, the mesh in the filters, you have response functions that give you a point spread function that gives you an X. Um, and you can deconvolve them very quickly with GPUs. And uh, I'm sort of uh, sick of seeing AIA images with the diffraction pattern. Um, if it's saturated, then we have more of a problem. But when it's not saturated, you can remove it very effectively. And there is an AIA Pi routine for that and an IDL routine for that. The AIA Pi 1 is GPU accelerated. We can talk about that a little bit more in the breakout session if you're interested. Regarding preparing for cycle 25, certainly um, there is now a critical mass in terms of using Python for heliophysics data analysis, and we will continue to invest in the development of AIA Pi. Um, there's a lot of new observing opportunities, and we want to make it as easy as possible to, to do these uh, joint data analysis. Um, I encourage you to look at Peter Young's talk at RESI, which lists all the upcoming XUV observatories. Please use the EM maps. Uh, Phil has talked about data-driven simulations. I think there's a lot of work to do with that. And we really want to have uh, cloud native processing so that people are used to uh, analyzing the SDO data close to the data and, and, and have an environment to make it possible so that they can do data analysis at scale um, with uh, very efficient scientific workflows and also be trained so that they can use um, the machine learning frameworks, not just for machine learning, but also for the speed for Bayesian inference and for data simulation. So I think there's a lot of work in that direction. So anybody who is particularly passionate about these last three bullet points, um, we would love to have your participation in helping us. With that, I would like to end there. So you can, uh, we can talk about the links to talk to the resources later. Thank you.